you don't get the, the original object that was garbage collected passed into the finalizer because the object is already garbage collected. If you, <coughs> some other systems like Java give you that original object, but this causes a lot of problems. So at a high level, both loop references and finalized, finalization groups, finalizers are, are unreliable mechanisms. The garbage collector might never uh, collect these objects or might do it after a very long period of time. Uh, and it also may differ between different versions uh, or different runs of the same program. Uh, so it's important to not rely on this too much. There's a, yeah. Could, could you name, like, uh, in, in finalization group, like, maybe finalize, maybe uh, the register, like, something that explicitly says it might not run or might not run uh, soon? Or That's an interesting idea. Uh, I don't think maybe register... No, that, that, that's just that's, that's a terrible name. It's yeah, if, if maybe we could follow up. If anybody has ideas for names, that sounds great to, to include how this is a sort of failure from mechanism. What I did in this document was like, I wrote lots of text about the different cases that it could fail in. And then when I got reviews, people put in like additional pieces of text about, uh, which is good. Yeah. Uh, a quick share, this is really cool to hear about finalizing. It's like something that I've heard among other developers that we use the future for rolling up this app. I didn't know it would be no problem, so that makes me excited. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, could you could you say more about the use cases that you can um, I'm having a really hard time thinking of one talk, but I definitely remember having multiple conversations that ends with the only we could have some form of pullback into the garbage collector implement some feature, but the actual use case is escaping the link right now. So, uh, I'll get back to you on that. If I remember. <clears throat> oh, cool. That'd be great. I mean, I think it's been clear for many years that developers want this capability, and it's been specifically denied because there was fear about it being misused. The, the current calculation to add this feature is largely based on WebAssembly. If you have things that are in WebAssembly that you're trying to expose to JavaScript. WebAssembly memory is, is sort of like C memory. It's this big, it's this big array, basically. And you want to allocate chunks of it for a particular purpose. And then you have to later explicitly free them. And WeGraphs and finalization groups give this capability. Uh, at the same time, it's clear that it's going to be useful for a lot of different things in JavaScript as well. Um, so we're, this is the work of uh, like Till Schneiderite from Mozilla and Satya Gunasekara from Google, as well as uh, others from Burke. And yeah, so we're going to present it for stage three of this upcoming DC 39 meeting that's next week. Uh, any other thoughts? Or, Wonder if you should. Yeah, Michael. Uh, is there anything like run finalizers on Axis? Run finalizers on what? On Axis, like when you're when you're shutting down your uh, the like nodes engine, you run all the finalizers. No, nope, they're not run. Right. Should they be? Well, I think in Java, that's one of the options you can say. I want my finalizers to run on Axis because if you're if you have any sort of persistent Things that you're trying to get cleaned up, that can help. Yes. I don't know how well it works, but I'm just, I was just curious because I don't think it's really fair. Yeah, so the experience with Java is a big reason why we didn't have new preferences and finalization groups in JavaScript for so long. Uh, like a lot of people in the JavaScript VM implementer community come from a, you know, there's a lot of yeah. heritage and overlap, and uh, it my understanding is that a lot of large Java programs uh, put complex logic in their finalizers that need that, that are needed for the program to sort of do its thing and proceed. Uh, and we re I really want to figure out how to discourage that in JavaScript because 
if this pattern proliferates, it's going to make it harder for garbage collectors to, to evolve over time. It's going to make life really miserable for garbage collector containers. Um, so I think making making things like finalizers never well, I mean, so one thing is Java has this thing where you can it passes the object <laughs> to the finalizer, and we specifically don't do that here. I think we I think we should not include such an option uh, about exit because that will give another kind of case where people will get this unreliability and they'll be unable to base the program off of it. Bugs will be more obvious. Yeah, I, I don't have a particular use case. So I'm just curious. Uh, well, I think I definitely agree about like passing in the object causes all sorts of crazy things. You can then reanimate the object. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, do, you, do you think that it will cause big problems to not have this option to? Uh, I, I don't have like I don't have any like I don't have any reason why to say that since, since it was there. It was, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's, it, it's trivial to wrap the API and uh, create something that does like uh, add the process exit and every node to run the same code that runs in the position. I know people don't do it sure. anyway, but it's, it's something you can do uh, from them. Great. And I encourage node to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd encourage like, node core to not do that. Of course, the ecosystem could do, could do it. Mm -hmm. I'm publishing a module on NTM right now. That's <laughs> yeah. uh, we are currently using uh, uh, the weak crack mechanism that is provided by the A yeah. to uh, solve some issues with the old and deprecated domain model. So just so that you know, uh, that we had some issues and that solved it. And uh, we might use weak cracks. Uh, for implementing some 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 uh, sort of uh, um, uh, for with us books to implement some sort of uh, CLS uh, context locker storage uh, on top of things. Just saying that this is uh, on the on the radar. Uh, domain essentially needs to solve the exact same. The exact same problem with the memory and curve of the track things that that could have been a solution. Just so that you, you know, it, it's feedback, it's not. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, did you get a chance to look at the new graph API? Do you think it would suit these use cases? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Uh, okay, so but I just, just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I thought there was some design for async hooks where it was going to maybe not meet some of those things like that we were discussing the last yeah. diagnostic summit. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. We are going in that path, but yeah. it's, uh, it's still uh, the solution for uh, domain has been to use uh, the, the C++ API that's provided by the A because we don't have this area for that. So, cool. Well, you can experiment with this API today in Chrome or uh, I don't know which node version it would have landed in, but at least node LKGR would. Oh, okay. Uh, with, uh, I think it's dash dash harmony dash weak dash refs. Okay. And if they, that makes the API defeated. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. No, the, the semantics will be subtly different, but probably the same. Interesting. Different about the same. <laughs> I mean, the, the semantics are slightly different, but the API is the same. <laughs> I, my, my job is to work out those, those subtle details, like write up the formal doc, but the API was already worked out before I, I kind of told you. So, So top level, wait. Uh, maybe maybe since this is about modules, everyone will run out of the room to avoid the, the controversy. But if you don't, then uh, 
anyway, uh, I think it's a really cool feature, which is good for script writing, which is a big use for Node, where uh, you just, you know, people use the Node Sync IO APIs a lot because they're they're more convenient because you don't well historically you have to use callbacks, but even with promise type things, you just put everything in an async function. So if you just have a little script where you just want to do something, you have to like write it in a main function uh, and then like call it. <coughs> but instead, what if you could just uh, you just have a wait at the top level? And with this proposal, it works not just with modules as the main function, but also modules at, at like the top level of the module graph, but it also works with modules that other things depend on. So if your module needs to do some initialization which might want to contact a, a database or read some file, then rather than uh, doing sync IO for that, you could do an async IO with promises uh, using top level weight. And a really important feature of this, which I think is has the potential to improve startup time is that if you import multiple modules and they all have top level await, the, their initialization code runs in parallel. So if one module depends on another, then that second one won't run until the first one is already initialized. But if you have two different modules that each need to do their, you know, read their different files off of disk to configure out how to configure themselves or something, then uh, <coughs> then those file reads can proceed in parallel because it's based on async await. Uh, and without that, like there could be some conventions with promises, like what if each module returns a promise of the export object. But that, that all gets really messy and kind of unscalable if you have a big module graph that all depends on something that's async. So that's why this proposal is added to the core of the language. Um, yeah, and so uh, Guy, Guy Bedford and Miles and I uh, collaborated on this uh, sort of the details of the semantics and it also a uh, long FAQ. So here is any, any thoughts on this proposal or this problem space? Thoughts. Right. No. Perfect. No. <laughs> A lot of people are waiting for this. Uh, who's waiting for this? I am. Please. Oh, okay. That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just have a question about looking at the argument against doing this. I used to share that. I'm just curious. Oh. Uh, or if anybody has something why they would not. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm just wondering what the argument would be against this. I don't know that. Anybody here wants to volunteer an argument against it? Against top level weight? Yeah. We have lots for debate. Is this like the, the static thing where modules are supposed to be parsable uh, statically and everything is synchronous and you can see the imports and exports uh, easily, but if you have top level weight, then uh, the actual module body can. Uh, do asynchronous stuff, and then the exports might not be available synchronously, and that might be it's all quite it's like what it's well, create confusing semantics where it's, it's, that's so there, the, there's this idea that you expect module loading to be synchronous. I think uh, I know it's good. The, the one, <laughs> one may uh, that the particular hazard that you described is present in like this buggy example here, like in the absence of top level weight, you could just. Uh, yeah, in the absence of top level weight, you could just, you know, have an async uh, function that you call immediately that initializes some variable that gets exported. But this is obviously immediately a race condition. People do something worse, actually. They, they export it then. They, they export the mode. Do people actually do that? Then. I thought that was just like a Twitter thing. <laughs> so people export. I actually think that I didn't believe it, and I actually saw examples. People export the model that exports it then, but and then because of process simulation, the like, dynamic import will. But that only works with dynamic import. That doesn't make any sense. Like, I know. I, uh, <laughs> People do a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. Well, <laughs> I, I, I understand that. You know, it's, it's not like they're, they're, they're being reasonable in their own perspective, but it's not the way I would approach uh, 
this particular thing? Well, uh, so I'm really I'm really happy to see this this positive response. Like working through this proposal has been uh, talking with with a lot of people who have these various different uh, concerns, and we're trying to work through the concerns. There were some concerns about the execution order, and I think we've landed on uh, is, is that here. Well, uh, like especially through guys' work, we've landed on a really I think predictable and and like regular execution model that matches how models work today. There were some ideas for like a slightly more radical change that we decided not to go with. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's also like the CJS interoperability issue. There's no way that you could require a module that has an await in it because you can't like reentrably execute JavaScript. But uh, yeah, does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, can, can people say a little more about all their positive feelings about this so that I can pass them on? <laughs> 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 So, you know, as someone who I I was very much used to the node style, um, and by that I mean yes I, um, and as someone who's like beginning doing beginning to dip my toes in ES6, I was seeing a lot of examples in the internet of like use a wait, and um, all those examples did not include an async function. They're just like showing a tiny code snippet that was assumed you have it in an async function. So from like a learner perspective. Um, it's nice because you're not going to get bitten by that of like, what am I doing wrong? I'm going to spend three hours figuring this out. Oh, this doctor, this, this was assuming knowledge I didn't have. Um, and so from that perspective, it's like you're, you're making it easier for, for learners or beginners um, to use the platform and like understand these, these weird kind of yeah, well, that, removing the weird barriers. That, that's great. I'm also, I'm wondering also if people have run into use cases where they have a module that's not at the top level of module graph or ones that one that uh, is sort of deeper in the graph that others depend on that would make sense to use this top level weight for. Like I mentioned accessing configuration files or databases when starting up a module. Uh, but then other people say this is an anti-pattern. You must not have this proposal because it would encourage people to do that stuff. Or something. But yeah. yeah, it's essentially, yes. Yeah, we should be to do that. Well, no, people would do it, and to some extent, it would make their code a little bit less brittle, essentially, because it's so it's a, both a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. So it's, it's kind of new from in what's the sense. What's the good part that I can So the, the good part is that. Currently, I see a lot of people creating boot, uh, boot hazards. So essentially, they they, set, they assign a module in, in Node. They assign a module dot export mm -hmm. within an async function. When, while nice. they yes, they do it all day. Uh, yeah, don't look at me like that. This is <laughs> you know, uh, real world code on how people use our stuff. Good information. Uh, and uh, having top level of weight on a on, on a module would solve that type of hazard, even though it's an anti-pattern anyway. So yeah. like, what should they do then? So they should be adding an asynchronous, asynchronous bootstrap phase for their application. Right. OK, yeah. that's yeah. what they should be doing. However, asynchronous is hard. And uh, people coming <laughs> on Node, they don't have the knowledge of setting up the project in a way that, that, is, uh, that, that is reliable. Okay. And we make it very easy to set up the project in a way that makes you do like initialization in a not so, so great way. So do, you, do you think top level eight provides like acceptable defaults, even yes. if they yes. could eventually migrate to yes, top exactly. top? yes, yes. That is the, the answer. I can I can write down a paragraph for you if you that that'd be extremely helpful. If you could file an issue on the repository with that paragraph, that would be the best way to get it out to people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you can't see, but github.com slash tc39 slash proposal top level away. Yeah. Are there implications for top level away in like a REPL environment? So that's a, that's a really good question. I think REPLs need to have more changes than just top level weight. In addition
addition to top level weight, you also want to be able to like redefine constant variables. And you want uh, like something in curly brackets, maybe you want that to be treated as an object literal rather than as a block. Uh, well, but then other times maybe you want it to be treated as a block. Uh, and there, so there's, there's a proposal for making a different grammar for rebels. Um, yeah, and top level weight obviously needs to be supported in this in this context. Uh, this proposal was uh, started by Bradley Farias, who I think did a good job of it, and it could use a co-champion. Uh, if you want to get involved in uh, pushing forward the, the state of the art of what you can do in the node REPL and making sure that this is common across the ecosystem, because everyone I everyone I've talked to agrees it makes sense to be common across the different places you put in JavaScript what the semantics of a REPL is, uh, uh, let's be in touch. I wrote, I wrote a summary of this whole thing that I could send to somebody who's interested in, in being more involved in. So yeah, I can send it to you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, should we now like write AST based like uh, just little like transforms for like taking all the like async uh, ifies, you know, top of, like like async ifies that were created to like fix this problem, uh, you know, and just like move it to the top. I don't <laughs> like, know. Uh, so project we should work on. Like, is the constant a semantic change? Because when you have a weight at the top level, yeah. what that means is that things that depend on your module uh, will wait for that. But if you have an async iffy, it's just going to go and basically like spawn off another thread and run in the background. Oh, I see. So yeah. you might want that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if the grammar, the syntax is expressing this in a very clear way, but that's that's like how it all works out in JavaScript. Like if you make a promise and just sort of drop it on the floor, like, okay, great. You've run something, maybe it's going to have a side effect like in the background. Yeah. And if you await it, then it's going to, you know, not let the outer async function resolve until uh, until that happens. So that's sort of what top level weight is tying into. Yeah, like I feel like that honestly is a if that's not in the in the readme, uh, I can like file an issue for it. But like if that's I think that's a bit important to just read for um, just, like for folks that are gonna like immediately want to go do that. You know, it's a subtle it's a subtle just like a subtlety in the runtime to like. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, can I convince you to um, check out the read? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anybody wants to get involved in helping out with educational materials for this, I think this is going to be uh, really important and, and helpful. But, but also, same with the other one. But I think Wheatgrass is like an expert feature, and Top of the Weight is like an everyone feature. Uh, so, yeah. So finally, uh, let's look here. Well, the temporal proposal. Uh, this proposal adds a new date, except one that's like good. Uh, and it's a little different from something like moment, which is based around one big type. Uh, so it is immutable, which is different. But the, the bigger thing is that there's a family of different uh, there's a family of different date types when you have different pieces of data. So say you have just a date, uh, but you don't have a time. So we're talking about like May 29, 2019, like a calendar date. This comes up sometimes in application programming. With date or with moment, you could say like, oh yeah, like midnight, I guess, because I don't have a time. With temporal, it's all based on a data model where, based on the information you have, you choose the appropriate type. So for that, you can choose a like, civil date. And if you have, if you have a uh, like a time that happened, a point in in global time, then you would use an instant, sort of on the other end of the the spectrum, where instant doesn't have a time zone, but you can also have something that does have a time zone. If you compare this with something like JavaScript date, JavaScript date's data model is just entirely broken because it doesn't have a time zone in it, but then it has 
things that act on behalf of the do calculations based on the time zone, based on whatever the sort of local time zone is, uh, which is just, just really weird. And then moment improves on that by having a data model that's basically like zone date time, where you have a time on the global timeline and a time zone. But uh, this still lets you fall into sort of logic errors, where you might round back by a day because you're looking at the wrong midnight and Anyway, so in here you just provide the information that you have, and it has uh, wait, this is the right file, but it has we have a, a readme and a, and a polyfill, and it's at stage two. We're uh, looking into proposing it as a as a built-in module. Maybe it could be like std colon temporal uh, that would export these different classes. <laughs> yeah, so here's like this really detailed documentation that Bill Dunkel wrote up. And uh, it'd be great to have your, your feedback on this proposal also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, built in modules? Like, is there any existing ones, or like, are there some rules that are going to be put in place for new features? Uh, what, what do you mean by rules? Like, if we just introduce this as built-in modules, then, then I would expect that other features in the future would follow the same pattern and end up as built-in modules as well. Yeah. Right. So, so are there some guidelines that are being discussed for what built-in modules should be? And there are guidelines being discussed. I don't think there's a great write about it right now. And uh, so this is the the hope from many people is that rather than adding properties to the global object, uh, like we could just put say okay single date instant zone date time okay they're all properties of global object just like URL and text encoder and date and string. Uh, eventually we might run into problems due to that with compatibility because it overlaps with somebody else's uh, usage, it could be confusing. Uh, but also it's, you know, JavaScript developers are importing things from, you, you know, NPM and they're, they're requiring things and if people are using this ergonomic syntax of modules, when we talk about built-in modules in GC39, it's always talking about ESM. It's not about, uh, you know, it's not about CJS, we're only, meaning the native modules with the import statement. <coughs> and the hope from many of us is that new features would be added in modules. This is something that Mateo's been agitating for for a while. Uh, and we haven't, we haven't really made up the decision yet. So we, there are various different ideas being thrown around about how built-in modules would work. Apple has a proposal that they would all be sort of frozen, which is interesting. Uh, Tierney brought up import maps, which is a proposal being discussed at the WICG, which seems to have pretty broad buy-in at this point, uh, for uh, allowing polyfilling of built-in modules and allowing sort of this extra layer of indirection when resolving a module specifier. Okay, resolving a module specifier, what I mean by that is when you see import and it's a string, there's something that translates from that into uh, like a node, a file name, or on the web uh, to figure out what to, to fetch, to figure out where to get the module from. So import maps lets you in, add for each one of those a, a fallback list. So you can say for a built-in module, if that built-in module doesn't exist, actually resolve it to this other thing that has the polyfill. Or even if it does exist, actually resolve it to this thing that will replace it and change it to something else. Uh, and so that layers sort of on top of JavaScript. Uh, I'd like us to consider using WebIDL for built-in models. What is WebIDL? What is WebIDL? WebIDL also lacks a getting started guy. <laughs>
WebIDL is a special language that you can use to describe interfaces. Most uh, web APIs, not JavaScript APIs, use WebIDL in their specification. And this is, uh, so for example, text encoder and URL are in their specification, they include, it's sort of like a header file for WebIDL. So you could think of this as like a, a DTS file, but it's a little different from that. Because, uh, so here, instead of class, it says interface, instead of extends, it says colon. Uh, and then when you have uh, like a getter setup there, it says attribute, um, you know, you have, you know, methods, those are called operations. Anyway, this all comes from like Corba uh, and its historical, uh, yeah, the OMG, that's another. Well, we call it Corba. What's Corba? Uh, I don't know. It's like a competitor to the World Wide Web, kind of. What is it? Sorry. It's in the 90s. I was even live. No, I'm totally live. Objects. Uh, they could be transparently across computers, and anyway, we we sort of walked back from that. I think it's it's good to think about network boundaries. That was like one of the takeaways. Uh, but anyway, one thing that they had was this cool language to describe interfaces. And so this could they said we have a class with these sort of methods and fields, and it's really useful. Because when, when you have a method, for example, like this, this draw rectangle that takes these doubles, okay, it's really weird that it says double. It should really say like number. But uh, double basically just means number. It's just the funny way that WebIDL makes it. And so in JavaScript, when we have a, a function in the JavaScript setter library, uh, there's actually a coercion that happens. So if you pass in a string where it says double, it'll cast the string to a number. So it'll call like two, as if you're calling the number constructor on the string. Uh, so it'll like parse the, parse the string. And in WebIDL, this, these conversions are the semantics of, of the IDL. So it's responsible for adding these type checks. So it could either throw an exception or it could convert one value to another value. Uh, and this is really useful at API boundaries. In NodeCore, there's a lot of checks and casts that happen at entry points to functions. And I think historically there might have been security issues based on checks not happening. I don't know about the details. Anyway, or at least the checks have evolved some over time. And so uh, I think this is a nice rigorous way to specify APIs. And so I want to look into whether we can use this for, you know, the new generation of the JavaScript standard library, adding a lot more things to, to sort of get good quality. And I'm wondering if it makes sense for Node also, and if there are changes that we can make to web ideal to make it more uh, interesting for Node. Or for open JSF projects in general. So like JSDOM is based on parsing these parts of the specification and automatically generating JavaScript code, which does the same thing. Okay, uh, any, any comments or questions? Great. Um, yeah. uh, about using what I do in core, I'm wondering if people will feel comfortable with generating the interfaces you know, with something, for example, that um, I'm sure like JSON or other reference implementation of or standard uses, uh, they have um, a generator that like parse the uh, web IDL, you know, um, files and then like generate a bunch of JavaScript file that, you know, implement like generate the interfaces while leaving the um, implementation for the implementer to like actually fill in. Um, I'm wondering if people would be comfortable with um, using this for new web API implementation uh, or like convert existing web API implementations to it. Um, for example, like converting the URL implementation to use this 
generated thing instead of like currently we are, we are like him writing the classes in the web IPL specification and it's not nice there's some holes there um so yeah just wondering Yeah, uh, I'm really excited about this this effort from Joey. Uh, you know, browsers went through a similar evolution where they used to just have a handwritten C++ thing that kind of corresponded to the specification. And then everybody figured out, I don't know, maybe almost 10 years ago now, that it makes more sense to generate this stuff automatically. And this led both the browsers and the specifications to get more like rigorous and compatible. Good. Any concerns? Okay, so uh, are there any other topics that people would be interested in, in reviewing? So, uh, yeah? Well, it sounds like I was out of the room for top level away. Sorry, but was there anything? Oh, that it I was so have? positive. <laughs> okay, cool. Wait, does anybody want to summarize for Miles? You want it. Okay, cool. I just wanted to just like a little bit of people saying they wanted it. There, there was one question about um, why, 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 what the problems were, like right. why, what, what the controversies were. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if that's got an answer. Okay, with that. So I'm wondering, uh, like in the future, would people be interested in? Maybe remotely having a conversation like this because for, for me this was really interesting to hear all your all your thoughts. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> cool. I guess I guess one thing that's worth clarifying because I don't know if it came up in the discussion. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I thought about this. Um, top level weight right now is only targeting the module goal. It's not targeting the script goal. So that means common JS, but not yet top level weight. It would only be like EchoScript modules that would have top level weight today. It doesn't mean that at this TC39, we could in the future try to standardize it in the script pool, or alternatively, that the Node engine couldn't try to implement top level weight inside of like our kind of common JS. But it would like break everything. Those horrible implications. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's common JS. Like, so largely um, rooted in like the timing and the synchronicity of everything, and so um, are scripts on the web. So, so uh, I think like the biggest motivation for top level weight I'm saying is like if you need to conditionally load models uh, inside the uh, inside the model the virtualization, and because like we have synchronous APIs and have like required synchronous, like I, I don't think that's that, like I, I was stuck a bunch of times when I needed top level weight in the uh, ESM. Yeah. Uh, was anyone here ever stuck needing top level weight in common JS? Like other than saving, writing a sync function? You mean like a, like a NFT pattern? Yeah, but like, like trying to do something asynchronous in a common JS model and being stuck because it's, and there's not a lot of weight. I mean, that's that's what I was describing earlier, but I don't think that's an yeah. And it'd be nice for scripts, but I've never had like a necessity. Yeah. All right, well, yeah. And if you're just writing a one-off script, you can just write it in the module goal and have top yes. level weight. I think the thing that it will introduce is like there's patterns that we're used to from common JS that are not capable of being recreated in the module goal today that you'll be able to do with top level. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe the main benefit of like, hey, I have this like asynchronous work, but I want like whatever is done after that work exported as a symbol. Like that is the pattern that it will make possible that is not currently possible in the module goal that we are used to in common JS and use that pattern a lot on the server side of JavaScript that we will lose as people transition to modules. But this will help us retain a lot of those patterns. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that uh, aspect of it. I want to encourage people whenever possible to still use the import statements and to not just switch everything to using top of the way with import if only because it's it's more parallel, parallelizable on startup. You can see further ahead in time, the engine can see further ahead in time which modules you're using, and it can initiate those like file reads and bytecode generation a bit earlier. 
So, uh, and it's more statically analyzable by tools. So please don't just start using top level weight for, for everything. Uh, I don't know if anybody has suggestions for how to document that because this is. I, are people going to listen to that? I, I don't see why they shouldn't. I don't know why they would want to do that. But people have frequently get this misunderstanding about top level weight that like that means that they should start doing it. And so I want to, yeah. I have an idea. Maybe it uh, might be a mic for me good because it's like a uh, long curve idea. Um, yeah. Here we go. Does anyone else getting kind of like hot in here? Is it dumb? No. All right. Um, so I have an idea. So I think um, I don't know if anyone, if everyone caught what I was saying earlier around the education around like, you know, iffies and and why you. you Maybe you shouldn't automatically just change everything to top level of weight and some, like so. I think there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of education around modules. And I was wondering if um, you guys would want to collaborate on a cool project that's like I don't know modules.dev. I bet like Miles probably owns that domain and maybe he can like give it to us. Um, <laughs> fuck you! No, I want it first now. Sorry, I apologize for this. Um, but uh, so, um, but basically, to just have like a simple stat, like one page site that like ex like a like a fun explainer that's super low, like low floors, um, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions, and I think like hearing I, like learning about this stuff in a way that's kind of like um, node contributor approved. Right uh, and and well, like like from folks from the TC or like in the node community, folks that are actually working on these things um, would be great. Like and uh, very good for like the education and the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and you know having examples and you know and having a place to also funnel questions um, from the community around like what's confusing and then like extending out the educational aspect of the one page site with like videos and or content. Um, I don't know. It would be a fun project if anyone's interested in collaborating on that. Like thoughts? I'm excited by that idea. Uh, I knew you would be. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, so I don't know. Maybe we can, I guess, what would be the best place to, um, we should just file an issue in the summit repo on this and we can continue the discussion there for anyone that's interested. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, you know, thanks everybody for, for this really interesting discussion and let's, let's keep this going. Thank you guys.